Well, could you give me control of the PowerPoint real quickly? Thank you. Oh. Well, maybe we won't have one today. Oh, there we go. Okay. So the text was on the screen. We just weren't quite there yet. But uh, there it is. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, if you want to reference that as we go this morning. Uh, A brief announcement before we get started. Um, Blood Drive will be next Sunday, and sign-ups are available outside in the foyer where there's those two tables. On the far left is a sign-up for the Blood Drive from 8.30 to 12.30. They'll be here um, to just take your blood. It's not a vampire thing. It's just, you know, general humanity. And so if you guys want to go out there and uh, sign up for that next Sunday from 8.30 to 12.30, the Blood Mobile, which just sounds fun to say, will be here uh, to take your blood which also sounds fun to say. So, uh, (laughs) Ephesians chapter one, verses three through 14 is our text this morning. As we mentioned last week, we will be in a series dealing with what it is we believe as Christians amidst all the misconceptions that exist over the next 11 weeks now, we will be just discussing the foundations of our faith, what it is we believe and why it matters. And so this morning we'll be coming to the doctrine of God, the doctrine of God. Now, um, I don't know about you, but one Sunday doesn't sound like enough time to completely unpack who God is. And so we're gonna focus on on what I think is the most important aspect of who God is in the Trinity. Uh, But I wanna invite you all to recognize that this specific aspect of the Trinity is the foundation that flows out into all else that we will understand about who God is. And so um, a book that I've read over the years that's been really helpful to me is a book by the name of Delighting in the Trinity, and I figured I wouldn't just talk about it, but I'm going to just offer the first person today after service who wants to actually read a book and not like, we'll just take this book and leave it in a garage sale two years later because they never actually picked it up. Um, Like this book, if you want it and you actually want to know more about who God is in the Trinity, it's just going to be right here after service for the first person who comes to grab it. It's yours for free. Never underestimate the power of giving away good books. Before we dive into this topic, I think it's important that we pray. Father, we come before you today looking at your word, looking at what is said about you, and recognizing uh, our own inability. Our own inability to comprehend, our own fragility and our frailty, Lord, and so we ask this morning where we are lacking that your grace would abound. Lord, we rejoice, we rejoice in who you are. We rejoice that you have sent your son, you've sent your son to rescue a people for yourself, for your own glory, and we rejoice that you do not just leave us alone, but that you even now are inviting us into your presence through the power of your Holy Spirit, making known to us your truth. And so I pray this morning that we would open ourselves up to what it is you are doing, what you have done, and what you will continue to do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. What comes to your mind when you think about God? What comes to your mind when you think about God? It'll actually be one of the most important questions that you answer in your entire life. It's one that will shape everything you do. The answer to the question of what comes to your mind when you think about God. You see, all of life is shaped in the deepest ways by what we believe about who God is. I wanna imagine for a moment if you were to attend one of our gospel communities and you showed up to one of our gospel communities and one of the leaders, maybe um, Ryan or Lori or Kevin or Maggie, they asked the question, they said, what comes to your mind when you think about God? And the room's silent for a moment and everybody thinks and then somebody peeps up, they say, you know what? What comes to my mind when I think about God is that God is love. 
And everybody gets very excited about that and we start to talk about what it means that God is love and everybody is loving the fact that God is love and we start to rejoice and everybody feels warm and cuddly and a little bit fuzzy and the night seems to be dwindling down after this wonderful conversation about God who is love and then somebody, a new believer in the corner, she interrupts the warm and fuzzy feeling with a question. She says, that's great that God is love, but since I became a Christian a few weeks ago, I've heard a lot of people talk about God in various categories. I've heard him talked about as God the Father. I've heard him talked about as God the Son. I've heard him talked about as God the Holy Spirit. And the more I've asked about this, the more I've found out that some way, shape, or form, what we believe is that God is triune. He is a trinity. He is three. What does that mean? And then there's an awkward silence and everyone in the room gets just slightly uncomfortable. Maybe a few people mention, yeah, you're right, you know, God is Father, He is Son, He is Holy Spirit, but there's very little practical help or there's very, very little application for what that means. And so what you kind of get from the room, what this new believer starts to pick up is that the Trinity may or may not be something that's very important for the Christian life. Maybe she picks up that this is just for people who, you know, are, are theological elites, those who really want to know about God, but this isn't for, you know, the day-to-day -day Christian life. And so um, some members of the home group, maybe they answer with, all you need to know is that God is kind of like an egg, you know, he's got a shell, and there's a yolk, and then there's the white, and you know, that's kind of like what God is. And then maybe somebody else is like, well, I've heard it said like he's an apple. He's the skin, and then he's the, the flesh, and then he's the seeds on the inside, and somebody else peeps up, and they're like, look, 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 we are on the border of Mexico. It's an avocado, okay? And then you've got someone else who says, well, you remember Pastor Austin's sunflower shirt on Sunday? It was kind of like the branch, and God the Father is kind of that boring part that, you know, we don't really think much about, and then with the leaves coming off, that's kind of, you know, the Holy Spirit because it's, you know, mystical. And then you've got the, you know, the beauty of Jesus in the flowers, the petals that fall off. And that's what God is like. Maybe somebody finalizes the illusion. They're like, no, no, wait, 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 wait. Here, hold on. Let's make this real easy. We've got ice. You know, God is really cold. He's kind of cold like ice. But then you warm him up a bit. And he's very drinkable. He becomes water. And then, you know, in his final stage of Holy Spiritness, he's very steamy and hot. And so then you've got those three stages, and that's how the Trinity works. And so this woman goes away, wondering how she ever converted to a religion of the steamy egg worshipers. <laughs> left with more questions than answers, and left with illustrations that move her to think about God as object and not personal. Move her with illustrations that try to comprehend the majesty of who God is with practical objects. And here's the problem with that. God is not an object. God is a personal God. And so maybe you can re relate. You've, you've heard these illustrations before. You've read in scripture, you're kind of confused. And whether you've been in church for years or you've become a Christian recently, the teaching about God being both three and one has most of us scratching our heads. Uh, a man by the name of J.I. Packer, a theologian, um, one of the greatest theologians in modern, modern history, says this about God. He says, the Old Testament constantly insists that there is only one God, the self-revealed creator who must be worshipped and loved exclusively. The New Testament agrees but speaks of three personal agents, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, working together in the manner of a team to bring about salvation. The historic 
formulation of the Trinity seeks to safeguard this mystery, not explain it. That is beyond us. And it confronts us with perhaps the most difficult thought that the human mind has ever been asked to handle. It is not easy, but it is true. I find it incredibly comforting that even a great theological mind, somebody who has done work upon work, dedicated his entire life to understanding God, literally wrote a book called Knowing God, still at the end here of this statement on what the Trinity says, that the human mind has never been asked to handle something more difficult. (laughs) This is a weighty and difficult and hard to understand topic. We have this doctrine that is in many ways incomprehensible for us, yet we as Christians claim that it is true. So here's what can easily happen. Here's what can easily happen when we, we get in church life. We claim, yes, that God is indeed triune. He is a trinity. He is one and he is three and we don't really know how that works and so there's two errors that this usually takes. And the first is, well, God's incomprehensible. We can't understand him. It doesn't make logical or perfect sense to us so therefore this must not be true. Because it doesn't make sense to us, it must not be true. And here's the problem with that line of thinking. God has not revealed himself to us based on our ability to comprehend him. He has revealed himself to us in the way that he is. While the term Trinity is never used in scripture, it's clearly communicated that God, while one in essence, is three in person. And if we lose one member of the Trinity, we lose everything. If God is not triune, God is not God. The temptation for us is to think about God in terms we can logically put together. Uh, To think about God in terms that make it easy for us to understand. And what the Bible invites us into is thinking about God not through what we can logically comprehend, but through the way he has revealed himself to us. God reveals himself to us most clearly in Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. And when we look first, not to what we can logically comprehend, but instead to how God has revealed himself, we see Jesus, who is the Son of God. When we do this, when we set our thinking first and foremost on that, on Christ, on the way that God has revealed himself, we find that we believe in one God who is three in persons. And while that doesn't fit logically into categories, we can understand it is what the Bible teaches and without it, we lose Christianity. We lose the gospel. We lose the meaning of all of life. There is mystery behind it, but we've been invited into that mystery this morning. It's a good thing that we can't perfectly understand God. Did you know that? It's actually a good thing that you cannot perfectly understand God. Because if you could, (laughs) he would not be worthy of your worship. (laughs) He wouldn't be worthy of your worship. And in fact, it's often in the mystery that God draws us more into himself. In fact, it's often in those moments where we don't know the answer that God reveals himself to us as God and not and not as someone who we can completely and totally figure out. And that is good news. The second error we often find in the face of the mystery of God's greatness is that we agree that the Trinity is what the Bible teaches. So we'll say, yeah, you know, I agree, Austin, about all that you just said. Yes, the Bible clearly communicates that there is three gods in one essence, or there's three, being, three persons in one God. I, I get that you say that. I get that you communicate that. I get that the Bible says that. Um, but it's still complicated. It's still complicated. It still doesn't make sense. And so I think what we should do is push it to the fringes of importance. Like, we really shouldn't confuse new believers with this. 
You know, we, we, really, we really shouldn't bring that up. Uh, this is complex. This is complex teachings. We should probably just push that to the fringes, give them uh, other definitions. Let's just make Christianity more accessible. Let's just focus on God's love. And then hopefully, eventually, maybe they'll be able to one day in the distant future figure out his eggishness. And so we push that. But here's the problem with that. Jesus does not think that this should be pushed to the fringes. Let me, let me explain what I mean. Jesus doesn't think this is unimportant. In Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Jesus gives the Great Commission. The Great Commission is go, therefore, and make disciples, baptizing them in what? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus seems to think this is foundational to a believer's understanding of their walk. Jesus seems to think that this should be one of the first things we hit on because before he says teach them, he assumes that they're being baptized in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Knowledge of who God is, knowledge of God as Trinity was in the mind of Christ, foundational for the disciple. Last week, uh, we talked a lot about the necessity for us as Christians to know what we believe. And on Easter weekend, we rejoiced and we celebrated in that which is central to our faith, the death and resurrection of Christ. And while the death and resurrection may be the central point of our faith, it may be the thing we hold tightly to as what we need to focus our energy and attention on as central, the Trinity is foundational to our faith. It is the teaching by which all other characteristics of God stand. It is the teaching that sets Christianity apart from every other religion. So, what comes to your mind when you think about God? What comes to your mind when you think about God? Here's how we've defined this in our statement of faith. Uh, We believe in one God eternally existing as one essence in a loving unity of three equally divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God sovereignly rules and reigns above all things. Let's unpack that definition for a few minutes. God is one. We believe in one God consistent with biblical teaching. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. This is not the plurality of gods that they just came out of Egypt from. This is one God. It is a singular God. This is not polytheism. God is one. Not multiple gods, one God. We do not believe in multiple gods, we believe in one God. I'm emphasizing that because it's important. But he's also three. And that's not different moods or modes that God takes. It's not like he was ice and he warms up to water sometimes and then if you put him back in the freezer, you can get back to that cold God you liked so much. Or if you heat him up enough, you can have vapory steam that really clears out your sinuses. That's not how God operates. He is one and he is three. He is not three gods. He is one God, but he is not one God who changes modes. He is one God with three persons. Are you confused? Good. We should be. Uh, We should be. He is three distinct persons in one God. The, The second thing we've stated in our statement of faith is that he is eternally existing, and this is ridiculously important, that he exists for eternity. Here is what Why does it matter uh, that he was eternally existing as God? Here's what sets us apart as Christians from every other religion. It's not actually grace and forgiveness that sets us apart. It's not. It's the Trinity. It's God eternally existing in this relationship that sets us apart. And let me explain why. Essentially what we're asking is if God is eternally existing, what was God doing before the foundation of creation? Different religions will give you different answers for this. If you were to study Islam, 
God, before creation, set his affection on his creation. Or God, before Islam, was setting his affection on his word. So either God is now one, setting his affection on an object, or God is two, setting his affection on creation. The problem with both of those, if God sets his affection on an object, God becomes impersonal. If God sets his affection on his creation, God becomes dependent. You see what I'm saying? If God is fundamentally just creator, if God is fundamentally just one who sets his affection on a creation, he becomes dependent upon creation to be God. So how can we as Christians say that God has eternally existed as God? How can we say that? Because before the foundation of the world, God the Father was loving God the Son through the Holy Spirit. He is self-sufficient. Here is why holding to the Trinity matters. The Bible tells us that God has always existed. He is outside of time and space, that he is the creator of time and space. And if we take the direction of making God fundamentally the creator, then God is desperately in need of his creation to be God. He isn't self-sufficient anymore. He's dependent. And while we affirm that God is the creator, it is not his fundamental identity. God does not need to create in order to be God. So if it's not creation that makes God God, what is it? John 17, 5 and 24, Jesus gives us some insight into the very being of God. He says this, he's praying to God the Father in the garden, and he says, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. What's 17.5? In 17.24, he says, Father, I desire that they also, speaking of all Christians of all time, whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So what was God doing before the creation of the world? He was existing in glorious relationship of loving unity. Since before the foundation of the world, God the Father was loving God the Son through the power of the Holy Spirit, we cannot even begin to understand the glory of God until we begin to see God as triune. The Trinity tells us that God is, in essence, a self-giving loving and relational God. C.S. Lewis, who I'll probably quote throughout this entire series, says it like this. He says, in Christianity, God is not an impersonal thing, nor a static thing, not even just one person, but a dynamic pulsating activity, a life, a kind of drama, almost, if you will not think me irreverent, a kind of dance. The pattern of this three personal life is the great fountain of energy and beauty spurting up at the very center of reality. You see, God has eternally existed in a divine dance where God is a father eternally loving and giving life to his son in the fellowship of the spirit and that has been happening for eternity. God is not dependent upon his creation to be God. God is God because he is God in himself. And so, when the Bible claims that God is love, it is not pointing to God's love for you. It is pointing to God the Father's love for God the Son, God the Son's love for God the Father, and both of those inviting one another into fellowship through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the God that is love. And it is that divine dance that comes pouring out onto the pages of creation. Life, order, beauty, mystery flowing onto the pages of time and space for all of us to see. I'm gonna share another quote. It's not gonna be on the screen because I, um, 
reading the biography of Jonathan Edwards, and I came across this this morning, it was last minute, so I, I didn't put this in the slide, but what I want you to do for a moment is close your eyes. Listen to the words as I, I speak them from this quote, and, and imagine the beauty of God pouring out onto the pages of creation. Jonathan Edwards says this, he says, the ultimate reason that God creates is not to remedy some lack in God, but to extend that perfect internal communication of the triune God's goodness and love. God's joy and happiness and delight in divine perfection is expressed externally by communicating that happiness and delight to created beings. The universe is an explosion of God's glory. Perfect goodness, beauty, and love radiate from God and draw creatures to ever increasingly share in God's joy and delight. You can open your eyes. The point of creation, the ultimate end of it all is for the purpose of enjoying the triune God. You and I, we have been created for that end. Our highest good is God. The point of our lives is to enter into that divine dance, to walk in union with the Son, in love of the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So if that's the point of our life, if the point of our life is to enter into that eternal relationship of God, how do we do that? How do we do that? And in comes the good news of the gospel found in our text this morning. In Ephesians chapter one, verses three through 14, we see all three persons of God on display. We see God the Father, we see God the Son, we see God the Holy Spirit, and so let's break them down into glorious categories for us to hold on to. God the Father in love initiates the plan of salvation. God the Father in love initiates the plan of salvation. In verse three, we find that we are blessed in Christ by God the Father. Before the foundation of the world, God the Father chose us in Christ. In love, God the Father predestined us for adoption as sons. Note to ladies here, if men get to be the bride of Christ, you get to be the son of God. Here's why this matters. In Romans 8, 14 through 15, all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. The literal translation is the word sons. Maybe you have a translation that says daughters and sons or children, but the literal translation is sons, and that matters. Paul goes on to say in Romans 8, he says, you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. This is not an accident that Paul uses this direct quote Paul is pointing back to Mark chapter 14 where Jesus, Jesus calls God Abba, Father. What is happening in redemption is that God is inviting us into his eternal relationship with the Son through adoption. And so when we are calling God Father, we are doing so as those who have been united to Jesus Christ, his son, that have been adopted into his family through adoption, united with Christ, we are invited into the divine dance of God. In verse five, it says that all of this was according to the will of the Father. God the Father initiates. He is pouring out an overwhelming fountain of love to the Son, and by adoption, he is pouring out an overwhelming fountain of love to us, the adopted sons. God the Father has always been giving love to the Son. He is orchestrating the work of creation. He's initiating the plan of redemption. It is the purpose of His will that redemption be accomplished in this way. It is God the Father who pours out His love and affection upon us, blessing us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. God the Father initiates. And then in our text we see God the Son who in love and joyful obedience accomplishes the 
plan of salvation. Verses three to six, we see that Jesus is the object of God's initiating work. It is only through him and in him that God the Father's plan from before the foundation of the world is brought about. In verse seven, we see that we're redeemed by, through his blood. In verse seven, we see that forgiveness of our trespasses comes through him. In verse 10, in the fullness of time, all things will be united to the Son, things in heaven and on earth. In verse 11, the Son obtains the inheritance. It is God's plan that the Son would obtain this inheritance. It is the Son who obtains it. It is the Son in whom our hope is found. It is in him that we believe. God the Son accomplishes our redemption. God the Son is the agent of the plan of salvation. In Colossians 1, 15 through 20, by him all things were created. All things were created through him and for him. Creation is a byproduct of God's love for the Son. You are a byproduct of God's love for the Son. Just a little side note on inheritance. You are part of Christ's inheritance. Like, I wonder if we thought in that category how that would change the way we viewed ourselves a little bit. You are part of Christ's inheritance. It is through God the Son that the Father creates, and it is through God the Son that the Father recreates and accomplishes the plan of redemption. It is by His blood, by Jesus' blood, by the blood of the Son that you and I are created. It is through His blood that we are recreated, and now we exist with Him and in Him because He has reconciled us back to God. He has accomplished the work of salvation for the believer. The Son accomplishes and reveals to us the heart of God through Jesus, through the revelation of God's Son to us, we may know that God is a Father, and we may look into His fatherly heart and sense how boundlessly He loves us. And then the text brings us to God, the Holy Spirit, who in love, proceeding from the Father and the Son, applies the work of salvation to the believer. In verse 13, we see that belief in Jesus as God the Son results in the Holy Spirit sealing us into the family. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. A better way to put this, especially in today's day and age, is that the Holy Spirit is the down payment. The Holy Spirit is the down payment, not the down payment from God and now you're left to pay the rest of the wages. The Holy Spirit is the down payment that God is saying to the bank of your heart that I will finish my work here. I'm guaranteeing. God the Holy Spirit applies. The Holy Spirit makes known to us the love of the Father and empowers us to love the Son. And as the Father loves the Son, we are now empowered to love the Father as the Son loves the Father. In Genesis 1, we see that the Spirit of God is hovering over the water. The Spirit applies the life-giving work of the Father, the accomplishing work of the Son. The Spirit brings it about to completion. So let me put all of that very simply. All of life is all of God. All of redemption is all of God. In John chapter one, verse 12, we are given an insight in how to get into this divine dance that for those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, we are given the right to become children of God. Through belief in Jesus, the Son of God, the Word of God made flesh, we are invited into the divine dance, united to the Son, loving God the Father in joyful obedience by the power of God the Holy Spirit. Here is why the Trinity is necessary for your faith. If you take one piece away from the Trinity, you lose the gospel. 
If God the Father does not initiate, you and I are lost. Blindly groping our way around the world, attempting to find our purpose. I mean, can you imagine if after Genesis 3, God just stopped? He didn't initiate a plan that a son would one day crush the head of the serpent? If God in that moment just stopped revealing to himself or to his people, he stopped speaking, he did not give to us his word, he did not send Jesus his son. If God stopped after Genesis 3, you and I would be lost. But because God the Father, in love for his son, by the power of the Spirit, pours out onto the pages of creation. The character of God is now displayed in his love that is now pursuing you. So if if God the Father doesn't initiate, we're lost. But if God the Son doesn't accomplish, (laughs) we'll always fall short. And you don't need evidence for that. You just have to read the Old Testament. You just have to spend one minute looking inside of yourself. If God the Son does not accomplish the work of salvation, none of us, none of us would have any hope for the future. We would look towards a day where we stand at the judgment seat and we would look inward and we would recognize that we are all wanting. But God the Son accomplishes the work of salvation so that by our faith being placed in his accomplishing work, you and I are given the righteousness of Christ. He accomplishes salvation. But if God the Holy Spirit doesn't apply that work, we will always forget. We will always forget. In the gospel, the eternal triune God has turned his self-sufficient life outward and set his loving care on us. And through his love, we are adopted into the life of God, sharing in the Son's relationship to the Father through the Spirit. And so here's my invitation to us. Why does this matter? other than all the reasons we've given. Why does this matter for us today? Well, the first reason it matters is I want to invite us to worship a God that doesn't make complete sense to us, (laughs) but still reveals himself to us in a way that we can see his goodness on display. To worship him because he is worthy. Why does this matter? Because without him, Your salvation is not bought, it is not paid for. Without the triune God eternally existing for all of creation, you and I have a God who is dependent upon us, not a God who is self-giving and loving and relational in his essence. We need the triune God, in order to make sense of the God of the Bible. If not, then we have God the Father, who is the traffic cop, who pulls you over, and sometimes, because Jesus is sitting in the car next to you, will let you off, but he's really still angry about everything. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, life in the son. We worship a God that is not like us and we get to be overjoyed that we are invited into that divine dance, into that relationship with this God. In the words of Martin Luther, man's only savior is the triune God we could never attain to a knowledge of the Father's favor and grace except through the Lord Christ, who is a mirror of his Father's heart. Outside Christ, we see in God nothing 
but a wrathful and terrible judge, but about Christ, we could know nothing if the Holy Spirit had not revealed it to us. So I want you to think of yourself back in that home group setting. And Christy Simone asks, she says, what comes to your mind when you think about God? And you respond that God is love. And God is love because God is triune. Because God the Father has eternally been loving God the Son by, by the Holy Spirit, I'm now invited into that divine dance to share in his joy and delight in the same way he has joy and delight within himself. God is love. God is love because God is triune. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I pray that you would catch us, catch us up in love of you. That as we learn more about who you are, that you would stir our affections for you. Lord, we know, we know that we're left with mystery here. And it is that mystery, that very mystery that drives us into worship. But we also know that we've been given revelation. Revelation of who you are. We can know you. We can know that you are a father eternally loving the son. You are a son eternally loving in the father. And you are the Holy Spirit stirring up fellowship between the father and the son. And so Lord, we Rejoice that you invite us into that relationship. The relationship of the one God who has eternally existed as a trinity, that you invite us in to be a part of the divine dance. And so this morning, Lord, I pray, stir our affections for you. As we look to the beauty of the trinity, as we praise you for being holy other than, as we praise you for being God when we are not, Pray that you would remind us that you have revealed yourself to us. And what you have revealed is life giving, redemption accomplishing, and redemption applying love for the children of God. So we rejoice in you this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.